I, 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 I came from LA. Please don't boo. Oh yeah, 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 woo! It's uh, spring in LA, it's gonna be summer soon and I'm not looking forward to it. Uh, Cause it gets hot and I hate the heat. Cause I'm fat. Yeah, I don't need any help from Mother Nature to sweat. I sweat eating a salad. That's just a joke, I don't eat salad. I always feel like my conversations in LA are different than in the rest of the country. My actress friend comes up to me the other day, Paul, saving up some money. Not sure if I wanna go on vacation or get some plastic surgery. I said, get plastic surgery. Then people will take you on vacation. It's tough for me to date in LA. I'm not traditionally handsome. Thank you. I always feel like I could do better in other parts of the country. I'm at least an Iowa nine. I could win Miss New Hampshire. If I was walking around South Dakota with my shirt off, people would be like, hey, who's the skinny guy with the great tan? Don't worry, sir, I know what I look like. I bought a mirror. Tried everything to lose weight, nothing worked, got rid of the mirror. Problem solved. My doctor recently told me that I have to lose weight. I recently told my doctor to shut up. I said I will do anything but exercise. So I joined a cult. Herbalife. Say what you want, but I lost 15 pounds. And one person cares. Thank you. I was feeling good about myself. Yeah. And then a 400 pound man comes up to me and is like, you know, guys like you and me. What? That's offensive, right, sir? Especially to guys like you and me. So I, uh, I did have to lose weight. I, uh, I, was, I had some health concerns. Two years ago, I was diagnosed with type two diabetes. I've never gotten a woo for that, but okay. I'll take it. Take all the woos for the special. I gotta be honest though, living with diabetes is terrifying. It's like living out the movie Speed every day. If my blood sugar gets too high, I could blow up. If it gets too low, I start to sound like Keanu Reeves. Woo, diabetes bus. I'll never forget the day of the diabetic attack. I'm getting ready for work and boom, I hit the floor. And the first thing I think is, I really need to clean this floor. <laughs> and then I start to think, what if this is it? What if I die? What if I go to heaven and I've been worshiping the wrong God? What if it's the Hindu God? And I get up there and he says, you gotta do this again and again and again through reincarnation. <laughs> that brings a whole new meaning to thank you, come again. <laughs> So I got myself up, got myself into my car. Note to self, ever having a diabetic attack? Do not drive your car. Whole world's going crazy. Colors fading, double vision. The stupid unicorn next to me wouldn't shut up. Make a left, I know how to get to the hospital. I finally get in. They put needles into my left arm, needles up my right arm. I felt like a fat Kurt Cobain. Oh, too soon. Finally, the doctor comes in. He goes, Mr. Moomjin, your blood pressure was over 200. Your blood sugar was over 500. You should be dead. He goes, we believe the only reason you're alive is because you have a will to live. Can we ask you some questions? Sure. Are you married? No. Do you have any kids? No. Do you like your job? Doc, if you don't shut up, I'm gonna lose this will to live. <laughs> Oh man. And like when I started thinking about my life, I started to realize what am I going to do to try to find a wife? And I've tried everything. Well, not everything, that'd be exhausting. <laughs> I can't really even say I've done the old college try. <laughs> I've done the millennial college try. She means I got really excited about a girl at first, then easily bored, and then I download an app. Most of those apps are dating websites. When I'm plenty of fish, turns out I'm the wrong kind of bait. <laughs> when on OkCupid, okay they must have ran out of arrows. <laughs> I tried 
Betty Harmony, they promised to find me my perfect match. What's that, a female hobbit? <laughs> my perfect match checked the box that she had kids. She forgot to mention she had six. I cannot go zero to six. <laughs> I can barely go zero to six in my 99 Saturn. Oh, you laugh, but that check engine light has worked all year. <laughs> I'm 35 and I'm single. So all my uh, married friends are a little jealous. Right, I got eight, 10 years younger, 10 years older. 25 year olds just getting out of college. 45 year olds just getting out of marriage. <laughs> Everybody's got their issues. Any single ladies in their 20s here tonight? <laughs> Welcome to Provo, Utah. <laughs> Let me tell you, in LA, they are expensive. <laughs> they want me to pay for everything. The Uber, the meal, their rent. <laughs> Anybody can buy me a salad. I need someone to pay my utilities. 35 year olds, they don't let me pay for anything. I took out a woman my own age last week, reached for the bill. She gives me a look like I set back the woman's movement a hundred years. <laughs> Excuse me, but how am I supposed to be independently bitter? <laughs> You've been all nice and paying for stuff. Don't think I fell for that trick when you opened the door for me. Now, if you excuse me, I'll be over there waiting for my Prince Eric. You know, from The Little Mermaid? Yeah, that's the problem with women my age. They were raised on The Little Mermaid. I hate that movie. I think Ariel should have ended up with Flounder. Well, think about it. Think I'm Warren Common. He's funny. He's loyal. A little round. A little pale. He's got a beard. Glasses. He's filming his comedy special tonight in Provo. Do I? Thank you. See? Yeah. Guys like you and me get it, you know. Oh, man. I, I don't know why I'm so single. I think one of the reasons is, uh, well, let me tell you this. I got people in my life trying to figure out why I'm single more than I am. All right, I had a lady at church come up to me the other day and she's like, Paul, notice you don't bring a lot of ladies to the service. Notice that was none of your business. <laughs> Did you ever think that maybe God doesn't trust you with his special little creatures? <laughs> maybe God doesn't trust you with his special little creatures. I'm not trying to hit a squirrel. <laughs> I'm not on Christian Mingle looking for raccoons. <laughs> My friend Marissa the other day, she's just looking at me. She goes, I don't understand why you're single. You're not bad looking. <laughs> That's not a compliment. <laughs> Sounds like a swipe at my personality. And she said it in such a way, like in the way that I defend eating at McDonald's. You know, like, well, it's not, not food. <laughs> it's cooked somewhere in the country. I got in trouble for eating McDonald's the other day. Uh, I was at the lounge at work, and I'm eating an Egg McMuffin, and the lady walks in, she goes, Paul, what are you eating, an Egg McMuffin? That's disgusting. You need to make better breakfast choices, Paul. She walked away. A Couple days later, Paul, are you making better breakfast choices? Yes, today I had some eggs, an English muffin, a little ham. Aren't you, it's the same thing. That's what an Egg McMuffin is. It's the ham, it's the egg, it's the stupid muffin. Just spread out. And then that's what I realized, that the Egg McMuffin is kind of like a metaphor for my life with women. <laughs> oh, they say they want the egg, the ham, and the muffin. They just don't want it all squished together in poor packaging. <laughs> I'll give you an example. I had a waitress that I really like. She comes up to me, she's like, hey Paul, just broke up with my boyfriend and I am single and ready to mingle and I'm looking for a guy like you. I took it as a hint and I asked her out. She looks at me, Paul, I just broke up with my boyfriend. I'm in no position to date a guy like you. 
This one still haunts me. I sit at this girl's house. She tells me, Paul, I just want a guy who will help me around the house. She said this while I was painting her room. And I got mad. And I would have said something, but I had to go back to Home Depot to get that second coat. So, you know. Maybe, maybe the thing is I really am not very good at keeping a job. Maybe that's what it is. I've had a lot of jobs in my life before I started doing comedy. When I was 16 years old, my very first job was at Man Movie Theaters, which was ironic because I was the only man who worked there. <laughs> I show up and there's 13 girls on the crew. So I'm thinking, jackpot! I asked one of them out. She goes, oh no, Paul, I don't date boys. And I go, well, you're in luck, because I'm a man. <laughs> While I'm doing the, uh, the work at the theater, I was getting my degree in teaching. And so when I got the degree, I made the next logical step, and I got a job at Costco. <laughs> I had three bosses named Greg, which means at Costco, even the management comes in bulk. <laughs> Finally, I got a teaching career going. And I gotta tell you, being a teacher is very, very, very hard. Surrounded all day by a bunch of self-righteous, know-it-all complainers. And then there's the students. <laughs> and um, I ended up, I got out, it was just too much for me. I got out and, and, and I got a job at Nickelodeon. And the first rule of Nickelodeon is, you don't talk about Nickelodeon. So let's talk about Nickelodeon. Right. I worked on a couple of shows you may have seen called Zoe 101 and iCarly. Anyone ever heard of them? Yeah. That means we either have a nice young audience or kind of a creepy older one. And there's an episode where the principal hijacks the show and plays the bagpipes and they put a green screen behind her and they're going to put funny images and someone in the office said, hey, funny images, Paul's a funny image. So they filmed me eating salad. <laughs> jumping up and down, eating, that's why I don't eat salad. It's like a Vietnam flashback every time for me. <laughs> Took an hour to film. We filmed it on a Monday. The show aired on the Sunday and I'm walking around the supermarket the next Monday and this little boy and his mother are walking up the aisle and the boy goes, Mommy, that man was on TV last night. And the mom goes, no, sweetie, they don't put guys like him on TV. I said, wait a second, yes, they do. Uh, 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 people like me, uh, Lena Dunham, Seth Rogen, Rosie O'Donnell, Amy Schumer, lots of people like me. The writer strike took my job, and so I decided to get a master's in English. I already had a bachelor's in English, I figured, let's double down on something that ain't working. <laughs> so once I completed it, I ended up taking the next logical step and got a job at ITT Tech. <laughs> Rest in peace. It was never a real school. They didn't even pay me in real money. They paid me in ITT bucks. <laughs> the cafeteria was a vending machine. They gave me a tour of the campus and they walked me into this room. They go, this is where the children learn electronical training. It was a bunch of broken ham radios. They go, that's why it's very important. You never use the words top of the line equipment. We use industry standard. What industry? The broken ham radio industry? VCR repair? Caveman? So I, I had to leave to I went back into teaching because I needed better health insurance. ITT Tech's version of health insurance was the DVD collection of Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> and a bottle of Robitussin. That was it. So I went back into teaching. And, and it was going well. It was going okay. And then, uh, then our school, it's a private Christian school, like many private Christian schools, got a little obsessed with football. And it started to become a political school in that way. In fact, we took down the sign that said, Christian character is what counts, and we put up a sign that said, Jesus wants you to make the playoffs. <laughs> it makes sense, though, that all these Christian schools over the nations are obsessed with football. It's all over the Bible. Right, right before Jesus left. He was like, go out into all the world to make running backs of all men. 
Blessed are the quarterbacks, for they shall inherit financial aid. <laughs> Maybe this is why Jesus had 12 disciples. He's just coaching an 11-man football program. <laughs> Judas was the kicker. <laughs> so I got out of that, and I uh, decided to pursue comedy a little bit more full-time, and I'm now pursuing my lifelong dream of poverty. Thank you. I, I knew that I had to get um, a full, like not a full-time job, but like a job that paid the bills. So the only place that would hire me was this after-school daycare center for five-year-olds. Yeah, they pay me 15 bucks an hour to give the kids apple juice and watch The Little Mermaid. It's, <laughs> I'm learning about some of the futures of these kids. This is a little five-year-old boy named James, about this tall. He's got his top two teeth missing, which would be adorable, but he's also missing the bottom two teeth. <laughs> Looks like a human Pez dispenser. <laughs> he's, got, he's got two girls fighting over him. They wanna know who's gonna be wife number one and wife number two. So I thought I'd use some Solomon wisdom. And I bring James over and I said, James, pick who will be wife one and wife two. And James, five years old, puts his arms around both girls and goes, ladies, it doesn't matter. I'm not getting married till I'm 34. <laughs> this kid has more game than me. been doing comedy, been doing the road. I joked about being in Iowa nine. It's kind of true. <laughs> Did a show in Tucson, Arizona. Ooh, yeah. yeah, all right. After the Friday show, two girls are waiting for me after the show. They looked at me, they're like, hey, you want to go sing karaoke with us? Yes, yes, I do. <laughs> we went to this place called Margarita Bay, not to be confused with the song Mar Margaritaville. In Margaritaville, they lost the Lost Shaker of Salt. In Margarita Bay, they never could afford it. <laughs> so we're gonna sing karaoke, so we're there, and I put, and I'm looking through the list of books and stuff, and I'm looking through songs, and the girl, Emily, who is a little bit interested in me, and her married friend, I never learned her name. I, <laughs> there was Emily, and she's like, so what song are you gonna sing? I'm like, I don't know, I'm looking. She goes, typical man needs a woman to make decisions for him. So Duke could play this game. I went, boom, Tiny Dancer by Elton John. <laughs> okay. So I go up there and I said, I'm gonna do Tiny Dancer by Elton John, which is a song that I like. And, and, and there's already three girls already dancing. So the girl goes, well, why don't you just go ahead and go on up? I'm like, all right. So three girls are dancing with me and I'm going, you know, hold me closer, Tiny Dancer. And Emily and her married friend still realize like, oh no, we're losing Paul. So they come over and I'm dancing with five women at one time. I haven't danced with five women in my lifetime. <laughs> and all of a sudden, this old man from the bar walks over as I'm singing and dancing, and he goes, I don't know who you are, but you're the man. He gives me a high five. <laughs> Tucson, Arizona, I'm the man. <laughs> and I'm thinking, how do I move to Tucson, Arizona? <laughs> Finally, we're done. And we go back to the booth, and we're sitting down. And Emily looks at me and goes, so you're from LA? Yeah. She goes, it's expensive there. How much do you make? And I go, that, no, I'm not answering that. That's like me asking you how old you are. I'm 33 now. How much do you make? <laughs> All right. So I told her, I said, well, you know, I do some marketing and I do some comedy. I do some stuff. I said, I make about $65,000 a year. She goes, oh my God. Because I realized later, in Tucson, Arizona, the average income is $29,000 a year. <laughs> Meanwhile, in LA, $65,000 is right above the poverty line. <laughs> so her friend says to her, Mary friend says, Emily, show Paul the tattoo. I'm like, there's a tattoo? <laughs> and she goes, well, I'm a Scorpio. And, I like, and so I put a scorpion on my shoulder because I like everything that's a Scorpio. And I go, guess who was born on October 30th? The Scorpio right here. And she goes, no, you can't be perfect. <laughs> I am perfect in Tucson, Arizona. <laughs> Emily starts to have a small breakdown. I put my arm around her for just to comfort her gently. Uh, are you okay? She goes, I... <laughs> I have a boyfriend. And her married friend goes, you don't love him. 
And she goes, I think I do. She goes, you're hooking up with the comedian. That was the deal. And I go, wait, I'm the comedian. Woohoo. <laughs> Finally, the <laughs> security guy goes, it's time to leave. So it's 2 a.m. and we get into the Uber and, and, em, and the married friend says, Emily, you and Paul should sit in the back seat. And Emily goes, no, I can't trust myself with Paul. I don't know what I'd do. And I'm like, well, if you're like any other girl, you'll just tell me about your boyfriend. <laughs> I uh, worked at uh, some supportive gigs, not supportive gigs. You guys are lovely. Uh, I did the old folks home a few weeks ago. They weren't fans. <laughs> Two minutes into my show, I hear this. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm leaving. <laughs> I go, can I, can I ask why? Because you're not that funny, and I don't have much longer to live. <laughs> then he walked away, it took two hours, it was adorable. It was just... <laughs> the weirdest show I ever did was a live feed on Facebook. It was in front of 77,000 people. It was to protest gun violence in the country. As I'm driving to Hollywood, I'm thinking to myself, this is the most millennial thing that I could do. <laughs> to protest something, have an open mic. If I ever have a kid one day, and he asked me, Dad, back in 2016, when the whole country was shooting each other up, what did you do? Well, son, I went on Facebook and told jokes. <laughs> What's Facebook, Dad? That replaced MySpace. What's MySpace? Well, that replaced friendship. <laughs> So I get up and I do about eight minutes and no one laughed, I bombed horrifically. It was just me in a room with a camera and about 15 LA comedians on their phone the whole time. Like I said, I was a school teacher. It was like being in the classroom all over again. <laughs> so I get off the stage and my buddy who was watching in Tennessee texts me, he's like, dude, you crushed it. I'm like, dude, I didn't. He's like, check the Facebook comments. So I did, oh my gosh, middle America, so much more forgiving than LA comedians. <laughs> People write things like, he's funny, he's got a punchline. One guy wrote, he's a little fat, but I'll go with him. <laughs> and then this guy from Missouri wrote something that I still don't understand. He writes, does this guy have Down syndrome? <laughs> well, I'm not gonna let that ruin my night. I got, made 77,000 people laugh. I got the likes and the hearts to prove it. I drove home, I put my head on the pillow, I laid back and I thought, why would he say that? <laughs> Do I have Down syndrome? <laughs> what is Down syndrome? So I looked it up. Would you like to hear the symptoms? Poor vision, excess body weight, short neck. <laughs> Number one disease associated with Down syndrome, type two diabetes. <laughs> Needless to say, my mother and I had a conversation the next day. <laughs> hey mom, weird question. <laughs> Was I born with Down syndrome? <laughs> she paused. <laughs> the woman who gave birth to me had to think about it. <laughs> she finally told me I don't have Down syndrome, but I don't believe her. I feel like I've had Down syndrome my whole life and people have just been perfectly pleasant. Like it's my own version of the Truman Show. <laughs> and if I have had Down syndrome my whole life, it makes sense. I've applied for 25 different jobs. I got all of them, of course I did. Who's not gonna hire the quirky kid with Down syndrome? <laughs> no one ever called me Paul, call me pal. <laughs> Skippy. I'd just be sitting in the teacher's lounge. People come up, we're proud of you. I'm like, I'm just eating a sandwich. And they put a camera in my classroom. They said it was for security reasons. Now I'm convinced they were just filming a documentary about teacher with Down syndrome. Y'all gonna see me on PBS one day. Provo, you've been lovely. I'm Paul Douglas Mucci. Thank you so much.